so I thought we'd just start by talking about how you actually came to be. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up, what your parents do, uh, what kind of kid you were. Uh, sure. I grew up in Wausau, Wisconsin, which is about the fifth largest city in Wisconsin, about 35,000 people, 75,000 if you count the suburbs. Uh, my father is an engineer, and my mother is an art teacher, so it's kind of fun that my career ended up being a blend of engineering and art. And, um, you know, I had a really wonderful, convenient childhood. In a small town, it was big enough that we had amazing opportunities. We had a world-class ballet school there. Uh, in town, you know, ice skating lessons, brownies, you know, wonderful debate team, all, all kinds of things like that. Um, and it was just a really great thing. But one of the things that happened along the way is I was always very strong in math and science. So all along I thought that I would be a doctor and I was really very specific in, in that. And then ultimately went to Stanford and, you know, it really opened my eyes to computer science, all the different things that, that were happening in technology and how applicable math and science were there. So how did you get to Google? There's a, there's a period of time where you actually were employed by another company, right? Uh, so I was at Stanford. I had done two internships at research, at research uh, labs, one at Stanford Research Inter International in Menlo Park, and then another at um, the Union Bank of Switzerland. They had a research arm there. And so I had done, done those internships uh, and then it was, I was graduating in 1999. I had done my undergrad in symbolic systems. At the end of that, I decided that I really wanted to be able to market myself as a software engineer, yet I hadn't done things like write an operating system, write a compiler. So I went back in my master's and, and did those kinds of things and also did more artificial intelligence work. And so I was graduating in 1999 with a master's in computer science from Stanford. And interestingly, the previous fall, one of my mentors, Eric Roberts, had mentioned Google to me as something that he thought I'd be really interested in, but I was like, you know, I just got back from Switzerland, I'm teaching for the first time, I don't have time to mess around with a startup, which was good because they wouldn't have been able to hire me then anyway, and they just weren't really ready to scale. Um, so I mailed them back because I was curious about it, and, and I said, you know, but I'm making my decision on May 1st, so I have to do all my interviews on Tuesday. And <laughs> I went to the office and they interviewed me at a ping pong table because their ping pong table was actually also doubled as a conference table. Who, and the funny who was doing I remember, the interview? My meeting was with Larry and Sergey together. Uh, and Sergey asked me all kinds of detailed questions about artificial intelligence methods like k-means clustering. And I was writing equations on the board and doing all the graphs and charts. And Larry just seemed very distracted. And, and then at the end of my interview, um, they got up and they said, you know, it's nice to, to see you. And then I could hear, like, as they left, there was this, all this hubbub. And then the office manager came in to the room and said, you know, I'm sorry, I know it was very important to you that you would get all of your interviews done today, but Larry and Sergey have just gone to pitch one of the venture capitalists on the company, and they've taken the entire company with them. <laughs> because at the time, Google was like eight people. So, and so the seven of them had headed off to the VC and like only had the remains. So she's like, so I'm sorry, but you're going to have to come back tomorrow morning to meet with everybody else. Uh, so I went home and then I went back the next day and interviewed with them. And then that, they, they ultimately became the 14th offer. And you know, I agonized through that decision more and then ultimately picked, ultimately picked Google. And so my, my next question about it is when you are in the development process and you're, before it gets out to the world, um, how often does anyone raise their hand and say, hmm, spooky? Uh, I mean, I think that, you know, one of our core philosophies over time is the, you know, our slogan of don't be evil. And I do think that, you know, Googlers all along the way have been really good at calling each other, not necessarily on the spooky factor, but instead on the, does this make sense, right? Like, given the amount of privacy or the amount of information that the user has to give us for us to provide this service, is the service beneficial enough? Right, and so you know, like we can't, we can't uh, send and receive your email unless you're signed in, right? Like, you know, we need you to have an account. So if you if you don't want us to have your email, that's fine, but it means then that we can't maintain that account for you. And so, you know, there's sometimes where people say, well, gosh, you know, sending and receiving email and having great search functionality over which Gmail provides and unlimited storage and things like that is, you know, that's really useful. Like, I'm willing to have an account for that reason, but. But I think that for us, you know, it's, it's often a debate of given the information that we need from the user in order to make this great, you know, will the user get enough of a benefit from that? Have you ever clicked on an ad in your email? 
I have actually oh, the ads. Okay, we, we're going to need to know a little bit more about this. So, uh, what was the, the it ad, for? The ads, and, <laughs> the ads and email story is actually a really embarrassing story for me um, in terms of how I almost blocked a multi billion dollar business. <laughs> um, so, it was the early days of Gmail. I was the product manager. My office mate, Paul Buchheit, was the technical lead. And you know, you, you're using about a project, product and you're building it and you're specking it. But every now and then, you just kind of need to take your mind off of it and brainstorm further in the future. And so one night, Paul and I were in our office, and we always have shared offices at Google, so there are three or four of us in there, and Paul was like, how are we ever gonna make money from, from email? And I was like, you know, Paul, this is simple. Everyone's offering four megabytes of storage. We're gonna offer like a gigabyte of storage, and you know, we'll give people some amount of storage, like a gig for free, and then we'll charge them for more, more space. Simple, clean kind. He's like, you know, I, I'm not so sure. Like, I think we should maybe target ads at the email, and I was like, you know, Paul, that's gonna be just creepy. So, so we do say this to each other sometimes. I was like, people are gonna think that everyone's reading their email and putting these ads against it. Like, that's a really bad idea. And we argued and argued and argued about it. And I was like, you know, Paul, we don't even have an email program that can send and receive email for more than the six of us that are using it right now. Because <laughs> we have this little program inside. And he was like, fine. I was like, how will we just figure out like how to get this working before we, you know, really, you know, go into a lot of detail about how we're gonna make money from it. And, you know, Paul and I were both night owls, and so around three in the morning, I went to leave. And I remember walking out the door, because Paul would come in, you know, just probably, he was sort of like the typical engineer, like come in about noon. And so I left at three, Paul was still working away, and I remember walking out the door, we had this little glass panel. As I walked out, I leaned back and I said, so Paul, we agreed, we're, we're not gonna explore that ads idea right now, right? And, <laughs> and, uh, and Paul was like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so Paul stayed for another four hours until 7 a.m. when he went home building stuff. And there, as I said, there were six of us in the company using the early form of Gmail. And I came back in at like nine in the morning, logged into my email, and there were ads everywhere. <laughs> like, and so Paul had hooked up the system that grabbed keywords out of your email and put ads against them. And I was like, oh no, um, Larry and Sergey are gonna show up at like 11, they're gonna log into their email, there's gonna be ads everywhere. But I was like, no, but I could tell from Paul's emails to me at the end of the night, he'd been working till at least seven, so I was like, I don't wanna wake him up now, but I'm gonna have to call him at like 10.30 and be like, you've gotta log in and like turn this off. <laughs> and um, and so the funny thing was that I had from like 9 until 10.30 to kind of play with it. And Al Gore was coming by the office. And there was an ad for Al Gore books. And one of my friends had mailed me and said, do you want to go for a hike this weekend? And there was an ad for hiking boots. And I was like, you know, like, these ads aren't bad. <laughs> like, they're, you know, they're at least relevant, if not useful. And, um, you know, and so I, by 10.30, I decided I wasn't going to call Paul. Um, and Larry and Sergey came in, and then this interesting thing happened where, and it's sort of interesting in terms of history because people get confused, is we were building Gmail, and I do think that whether or not at targeting ads at email is still an open question, it's still an open issue of debate between Paul and I, I mean, that's how we, we do it. But what happened that night was Paul basically figured out how to target our text ads that had been running alongside of search at content, which traditionally on the web, about 5% of page views that are done every day are searches. So if you walk into like a cyber cafe or a classroom, about one in 20 screens will have a search page up. Which basically meant we had a great database of ads that was good at making money from 5% of the web. What Paul had done was given any paragraph, given any amount of text, he could find a relevant ad from our database to run alongside it. And so it basically was a way of taking our ads database and saying we're not just gonna put these ads on Google search, we're gonna put these ads out on the web. So today when you see those blocks of textual ads that say ads by Google on the bottom, that's something called AdSense. And it was actually born that night. Uh, and it in truth is actually much more successful than even ads inside of Gmail were. Because Larry and Sergey said, wow, like this is amazing. Let's rip this out of Gmail. Just let people run this on whatever pages that they have on the web, which meant that bloggers could suddenly quit their job and blog full time because they could make money from it. And people um, would, you know, like about.com were like, we can put even more content online because we can make money from it. And so, you know, we, we launched AdSense, which I think last year was somewhere in the, you know, the five to seven billion dollar revenue range. <laughs> Um, so, you know, so it was this really amazing thing where, you know, that Gmail, that, that experiment that happened inside of Gmail became this big product outside, which 
I almost quelched with my, you know, hey, Paul, like we agreed we're not doing that right now, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, the, those types of things, it's just, you know, it's that uh, past your quote of, you know, chance favors the prepared mind of, you know, you're, you're messing around with these types of things and, and seeing potentials and opportunities and whether or not ads and email is a good idea. Thinking about how ads could target at email actually let us take ads and target it really broadly at content. 